I'm Jeff Raleigh, and you're watching Learberg TV. Today, we're here with our local veterinarian, Dr. Jody Bull, and we're going to be discussing senior dogs and rescue dogs for senior rescue dogs. So, November is Adopt a Senior Month. So we're here at Bob's House for Dogs, which is a local area shelter or a rescue organization. We'll show you guys around this place a little bit. It's a very unique rescue organization. Rather than your typical shelter with dog runs and kennels, this is really kind of designed to be similar to in your home. So there's a lot of couches that we're sitting on here. They have X-Bens set up everywhere. The dogs have kind of free reign and they're managed to the point where they know better about how they're gonna interact once they get into a home. So it's a really cool kind of concept and it's a all volunteer and all uh, donation based organization that was started by a local family here after they had uh, kind of tragically lost one of their own dogs. They started this organization. So we'll show you a little bit about that and we're gonna to talk to Dr. Bull about why rescuing senior dogs is such a good thing and what those of you who would like to rescue a senior dog should do to kind of set yourself up for success. So with all that said, Dr. Bull, thanks Hello. for being here with us. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. I guess the uh, kind of the first question is a little bit about yourself. Mm -hmm. How long have you been a veterinarian? Can you kind of tell us a little bit about your path before yeah. coming here? Well, I grew up locally in this area. I grew up in Bloomer and I grew up on a little hobby farm. Um, we didn't have any um, milk cows. My dad was a teacher, but we had a little hobby farm. So we had some cattle and various animals out in the barn. And uh, my dad decided that uh, I needed to stay out of trouble. And so that's how I got involved with the animals outside. Um, and uh, that just grew on me. And when I was in about sixth grade, um, I had a cat that was injured out in the barn and I took it in and rehabilitated it and so that's what started me on my path and that's that cat uh, inspired me to go to veterinary school. So I worked uh, my way through school and graduated at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Veterinary School back in 1992 so I've been practicing about 24 years. Um, my first couple of years I was um, southern part of the state working in a mixed animal practice um, but it was a little too far away and uh, so I moved back closer to home into Menominee and stayed there for about 10 years uh, practicing mostly small animal and then from there I moved to Eau Claire Animal Hospital where I've been practicing for about another 10 years so yep very cool <laughs> yeah and we had kind of come to know you through Cindy who is mm -hmm. our resident dog expert here at mm -hmm. Learburg yes. and we've always been really selective at vetting our vets for yes. <laughs> yes. lack of better words but yes. your experience kind of really showed in your work and I think that's why yes. Cindy kind of recommends everybody that we know go to you yeah. and I got out of the army and came back here and I said what vet am I going to use Cindy said well there's only one that's worthwhile <laughs> going to and that's Dr. Well, Bull. I, so. I appreciate <laughs> that she 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 does her own really wonderful work and sometimes I even go to her um, <laughs> because she has a lot more time sometimes to research things and and I think we both uh, tend to uh, think outside the box mm -hmm. sometimes and I don't like to think about just traditional Western medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm open to other ideas. I think there's always new things that we can learn and we can try. So I think that's why we get along so well is that, you know, I can, I can back her up if, if she needs, you know, emergency care. I can do the Western stuff and, you know, her and I work well together with the other things. Yep. Yep. It's very cool. Yeah. So at what age do, would you typically consider a dog to be senior? So. Well, there's, there's standard kind of approximate ages where we consider a dog senior. Um, in general, most of the time it's anywhere between 8 and 10 years of age for most breeds. But you have to remember that the size of the breed, um, it varies a little bit. In general, the smaller the dog, the longer the lifespan. And so then their senior years, it comes a little bit later. So small breed dogs, um, they live anywhere from 14 to 17 years. Their senior years probably happen at around 9 to 10. Mm -hmm. um, middle, uh, middle sized dogs, somewhere around, um, they live 10 to 14 years. Average, or average senior years, probably 8 to 9 years old. Giant breeds, they may, their lifespan is more like 7 to 9 years of age because they are so big. Um, and they become seniors more like 7, 7, 8 years old. So. Yep. Okay. What, uh, 
I guess within those different groups that we would mm -hmm. consider senior dogs, what are some of the more common health issues that you see? And I know that's a really broad question because there's a, a million different question. things. Yes, and I guess yes. maybe the better way would be yes. what should people be looking for yes. when they get their senior dog? Yeah. What kind of things should they know to identify, hey, I need to bring my dog to the vet? Yeah. Well, each size dog tends to have different problems. Um, and so, but in general, I guess I would say as a senior dog, you're looking at um, mobility issues, cognitive issues, um, emotional type things, and then dental disease, uh, I think across the board. Um, if I was to say anything uh, about different size dogs, if you brought me a little dog, I'd say the biggest thing I worry about with them is their dental health because mm -hmm. they have much smaller mouths. I tend to see more dental problems, dental pain, things like that. The large, giant breed dogs that I see, most commonly their biggest problem is orthopedic diseases. So arthritis and things like that. Because they t they, those dogs tend to chew on bones a lot of their life and they're big chewers, I don't see quite as much dental disease, mm -hmm. but I still can see it. But I have much more orthopedic problems with those dogs. On the dental disease, because that's really something that the owners could do a lot to prevent. Mm -hmm. So what types of things do you recommend these owners mm -hmm. of the senior dogs be doing as far as brushing mm -hmm. their teeth? Yep. And with that, is there a lot of things that you tell people that they should do and it's just like the normal dentist when they tell you yes. you need to floss twice a day yes. and nobody actually does it? Right, exactly, <laughs> yes. So I, I really get, I really want to be honest with them and I want them to be honest with me because I can tell them, yeah, you should brush your dog's teeth every day. But maybe that dog doesn't want to have their teeth brushed. You mm -hmm. know, they're set in their ways. Maybe their mouth hurts. Maybe they just don't want to have it done. So, so for some dogs, it's unrealistic. For some people, it is also unrealistic because maybe they don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um, they have a big family. They're very busy. Um, you know, they both work. Um, so maybe they don't have the time. Maybe they travel for their work where they're not there a lot. Um, so a lot of things uh, can play into that, whether or not they can actually brush their dog's teeth. Um, studies have shown that unless you can consistently brush your dog's teeth at least every other day, minimum, then you're probably wasting your time because the plaque sets on the teeth hard enough where you can't get it off. And then we're going to have to clean them professionally just as often as if you did nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I approach it. I ask him, first of all, do you think you can do it consistently every day? And if not, then maybe we use other tools such as sometimes dental um, diets work sometimes. Um, uh, if you can get them to chew on bones or certain types of rawhides, um, playing with certain toys that act like floss, and that like was, rope toys, things like that. That was going to be my next question yes. is how you feel about some of the t toys out there that are marketed as yes. dental toys. Right. Do they actually I think if, if you can get the dogs to, to use them and mm -hmm. interact with them and get them to use them appropriately, yes, they can. Um, some of the dental chews or like dental treats, um, it all depends. Uh, sometimes they don't um, use them enough or they only chew on one side of their mouth so they're not getting the other side um, cleaned off. Um, and the other thing too I worry about with older dogs is if you're adding many calories. Some of those dental treats can add a lot of calories into a day. Mm -hmm. And if you're giving two or three or four of them every day, that's a lot of calories. So you have to adjust their other diet so they don't become overweight. Yeah, we just, we had a bunch of free samples of some dental treats and mm -hmm. we looked on the ingredients of them. I yeah. realized I can't even feed this to my dog exactly. because it's going to do more damage <laughs> for him to eat it exactly. than it will to clean his Exactly. Teeth. And the number of treats you have to give of those to make any difference in their dental care um, is quite a few. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's just an adjuvant. It's one more thing that you can add in, but you can't rely on that only for their dental health. So then expanding more back onto the larger breed dogs with the mm -hmm. orthopedic, mm -hmm. is there things that those people should be working on? And I understand that obviously it's going to be the same as it's going to be dependent on the people and their right. lifestyle as to whether right. or not they can right. do things like go swimming or right. yep. is there any other supplements or anything that would help that we should be focusing on for our older dogs with joint or orthopedic yep. issues? I always recommend that um, whenever I see an animal that's having orthopedic issues, I always start with glucosamine supplements. I think that is um, a worthwhile supplement. 
For some dogs, depends on the severity of the, the issue, it may, it may not be everything. It may not take away the pain completely, um, but it can certainly help. And if we need to do any other medications, at least then we can use less of the medications mm -hmm. because we have the glucosamines on board and we don't need to use it as much or as often. So Makes it sense. can be very helpful, yes. So the next question that I have uh, pertaining to senior dogs is something that I think is really common with everybody and kind of strikes home for me and that's along the lines of cancer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Rainy, who you knew very well, yes. we fought with cancer all last year and she ended mm -hmm. up living nine months that we didn't really expect. Yeah, we and, didn't expect her to live at all. Right. Yeah. And she prevailed through it yes. and got through that. Mm -hmm. But what uh, questions that we get along the lines of cancer are, is it breed specific? Do you see mm -hmm. more cancer prone in specific breeds or what do you think along those lines? There are certain cancers that are more prevalent in certain breeds. So um, like uh, Bernice Mountain Dogs, because of their limited genetic base, they tend to develop ca cancers in general more often um, mm -hmm. than other breeds and I think that has a lot to do with their genetics. Um, once you uh, get a big variety of genetics into dogs, I think that's much better. Um, but for that breed, they're, they're so limited. So we see a lot of cancer in, those, in that breed specifically. Um, osteosarcomas uh, tend to be more prevalent in golden retrievers, for instance, or the giant breed dogs. We see those, that's bone cancer. Um, but as far as other types of cancers, um, I think a lot of breeds have them, various types of cancers. Those are two that I can just think of right now that mm -hmm. we see in specific breeds. And so. I think too a lot, since we're really kind of talking about rescue dogs right mm -hmm. now, the genetics of the dog is something that yes. most rescue organizations are not going to know the specific genetics Correct. before you get your dog. So that's a hard right, one to right. tell. It is. But kind of in general, is there something that people should be doing if they know that they have a breed that may be more prone to cancer, bringing them into the vet for mm -hmm. annual physicals? Mm -hmm. And again, it's a hard thing to catch until right. it's too late. It is. Which we yeah, I think the biggest thing is just being very observant, knowing your dog, um, running your hands over them, looking in their mouth, um, and paying attention to what they're telling you. If they are all of a sudden, you know, being aloof, um, sleeping more, um, maybe they are not as active, they don't greet you. Um, all, these, all these things are kind of symptoms where dogs are not feeling well, uh, mm -hmm. something's wrong. Um, so any of those symptoms like that where they're just not right, um, you should always take them in and have it examined. Um, most uh, clinics are starting to advise twice a year um, exams now, especially for geriatric patients because they're aging. Um, and things happen a lot quicker. And if we can catch things sooner, sometimes we can do things with those cases and um, alleviate pain. Um, sometimes we can do surgery. Uh, if we wait too long, sometimes we can't do surgery um, because it becomes too big or involved. Um, and so just like with humans, early detection is key. And so running routine lab work and catching things early is important. Sometimes uh, x-rays. Um, can pick up on things. Uh, a good physical exam can catch a lot of things too. So mm -hmm. just having somebody that does a very good thorough physical exam is important. Yeah. It's something that I'm always impressed with yourself <laughs> and veterinarians in general because you. you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor, mm -hmm. hey, here's how I feel. Yes. They diagnose you off that. Yes. But yes. in your field, yeah. They're not telling you that. how they feel. You have to figure it out based <laughs> yes. on what their owners say. Oh, they're yes. acting a little goofy. Yeah, yeah. So the the most common thing we say is, oh, they're not not himself. Well, what does, what that, does mean? that mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty vague symptom. Right. And so yes, we do have to rely on our senses and uh, and our touch and um, you know feeling for things and knowing what's out of the ordinary in a in a physical exam. Mm -hmm. So yep. So kind of moving on from actual specific health issues, what are some things that people can do around their house to make it more comfortable or kind of set their house up for bringing that senior dog into right. the home? Right, right. Well, some dogs will have hearing loss, vision loss. Um, so when you're dealing with a senior dog like that, oftentimes if you're the type of person who likes to change up their environment a lot, move the furniture around, 
things like that. Sometimes that can be very stressful for a senior dog because if they're having trouble seeing, maybe they're going to bump into furniture when it's moved. Mm -hmm. You know, they learn where things are. They learn where their food bowl is and, and where the furniture is and they, they walk around it. Um, so if you're moving things around a lot, that can, that can be stressful for them. Um, and they have to readjust all the time. So limiting how you move things around is helpful. Um, solid footing is really important, especially for those giant dogs or those big dogs that have orthopedic problems. Slippery floors, linoleum, wood floors, that's really hard for them because they can't get their footing and then they splay leg or they fall. Mm -hmm. um, so using a lot of rugs, using non-slip um, runners, um, like if you have to go from room to room or if you have to go through a kitchen to get out the door, then you know, putting a long runner down the floor so they can navigate across that. Um, and then um, just nice cushiony beds because they're, they're old, they're losing muscle mass a little bit, so their bones are, it hurts. And uh, so just laying on a, a hard floor like they did when they were little, they don't want to do that anymore. So, and you'll see, awesome. you'll see around <laughs> here as you, as you go around that everything is nice, cushiony, big, thick beds. Mm -hmm. And most of the dogs, they don't want to lay on the floor. They go for the beds and the couches. So, and heated. You know, as they get older and they get arthritis, just like with us, heat is wonderful. So if you can afford it, a heated bed is also really wonderful. Yeah. And we're going to show some footage of around Bob's yeah. house here yes. and how kind of cool it is how they have it set up with mm -hmm. all the couches for the dogs and yes. they have everything divided off with these exercise pens, which yes. here really comes into play because they've got 15, 20 dogs. How many yes. did they tell us earlier that they have at max I don't know how. I don't, ha I don't know how many they said. To, I, they've got about we'll five or again. six of them out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But uh, yeah, they've got a lot of dogs here and then yes. they've got it all divided off with X-Pens and there's big cushy plush beds yes. and all the X-Pens yes. for the dogs yes. to uh, kind of yeah. have their own space. So it's yep. a cool place. It is. Um, another thing that's really nice um, for little dogs as well as big dogs is using ramps in the house. So if they got to go up um, some stairs or when you go down outside, if you got to go down a couple stairs, um, do little dogs that like to jump up on the bed, if they're having a hard time getting up there, then it's really nice to have little steps. Um, so a couple, two, three steps to go up on the couch or up on the bed. If you're going outside, you can make a build a ramp with some outdoor um, carpeting on there so it's non-skid so that they can learn to go down the ramp instead of having to go down the stairs. Sometimes they trip and fall. Um, going up into vehicles, um, you can get uh, mobile ramps mm -hmm. that you can put in the back of a vehicle and then you pull it out and they can get up and down through there. So making it easier for them to get up and down off things is important too. And at least, I mean, especially in vehicles, if you don't have that ramp, mm -hmm. I would recommend, especially with older dogs, to pick your dog up, yes. put them in, pick yes. them out, and pull them out. Because right. jumping up and down into that vehicle is hard on their joints. It, it can hurt, and especially so if, if they have a really. right. And if they're, if they're losing muscle mass just because of aging and they don't have the strength, then they may not be able to jump up in the vehicle. So mm -hmm. you got to help them out. Mm -hmm. Yep. You had uh, mentioned talking about rearranging the house and whatnot mm -hmm. and mentioned dogs that have, are blind or that are mm -hmm. losing their eyesight. Mm -hmm. So I think something that is really common with older dogs when their eyes start to get cloudy. Mm -hmm. and everybody that's watching this right now, if you've been around a dog that's more than 10 years old, you've probably started yes. to see that. Yes. So is that a sign that they are getting cataracts or going blind or mm -hmm. is that something mm -hmm. that every dog owner should be concerned with? Yeah. Well, there's two different things that happens with dogs' eyes as they age. Um, one is what's called lenticular sclerosis. And that has nothing to do with the lens. It's, they're not cataracts. It's just an age-related change of the pupil. And so they get kind of this bluish, cloudy film. Um, it usually doesn't affect their vision, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, so now that's different than cataracts. Cataracts are calcification of the lens inside the eye. And as that cataract gets thicker um, and more calcified, then it starts to block their vision and then they can't see. Um, so kind of two different scenarios there. The only way you can really tell the difference is have your veterinarian look because then they will look in the eye um, mm -hmm. and make sure that it's not something that you need to have seen. Yep. Um. My next question kind of goes right into that of having your veterinarian look is mm -hmm. what kind of things do you recommend people do to kind of set themselves up for their first vet visit? Mm -hmm. So once they 
rescued their new dog and now mm -hmm. they know, okay, I'm going to go bring them to the vet. Are there things that they can be doing so that when they get there, it's a mm -hmm. little bit easier for yourself right. and for the dog? Right. Well, I oftentimes um, recommend just to see how they react. Um, you know, our clinic is always open and at most any clinics will tell you this is that, you know, why don't you just bring them in for a visit? Mm -hmm. Let's see how he reacts to the environment. Um, don't necessarily, if you can do it, don't make that first visit something where we're poking them and prodding them and have their first visit bad. Make it a pleasant experience. And maybe ask for a tour and, and go around and just let them walk around and investigate. That way they don't feel as, as apprehensive as co coming in every time. So just doing a dry run is helpful. How are they going to react? How are they going to... Um, how are they going to react when they come in? Um, then the next thing is, is that sometimes with older pets, if there's a time in the clinic where it's really, really busy and there's a lot of animals, usually that means first thing in the morning when we're admitting a lot of surgeries or at the end when we're discharging a lot of pets, pets are going home from surgery, going home from boarding, things like that, where there's a lot of commotion that can be stressful for older dogs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people roaming around and dogs roaming around and barking. Maybe that's not the best time to bring your older pet in for the first time. Right. Ask for a time of the day where it might be a little quieter. Um, and if they do have some issues with other dogs, always ask, you know, uh, can I sit out in the vehicle? And once you have a room ready, call me out in my vehicle, let me know so that we don't have to sit in the waiting room if that stresses them out. Um, or uh, can I get into a room right away so that we're not out in the waiting room with a bunch of other dogs? Yep. Always ask that ahead of time. Most clinics will accommodate that, and now with cell phones, it's really easy to do that. So we have a lot of patients where we flag them in our computer so that we know when they come in, get them right back, get them right back and they do much better that way. They don't mm -hmm. get all agitated and worked up even before they're into the room. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think the coming and doing the tour and stuff is something mm -hmm. a lot of our viewers can really relate to, at least those that mm -hmm. are sport dog trainers out there that mm -hmm. are doing a lot of generalization work and going to different environments to do their training. Yes. It's the exact same concept. Right. And you and I have talked about it with my lab, who's a little bit sketchy mm -hmm. and freaked out of people <laughs> and he growls yes. when he comes to the vet yes. office and just yep. bringing him around and getting him used to the area and the environment before yes. Yes. you're poking him and prodding him exactly. and figuring out what he's got going on. So. Exactly. I actually have one client who we figured out after the first visit that um, we actually had to have her s scheduled at the end of the day, um, scheduled it with me, and they sit out in the, in the car. And when I'm ready, um, we bring her in through the side door, not even the front door, bring her in through the side door, through the back hallway, into the room from the back side of the room so the dog never sees the front area. I do everything I need to do quickly, and then they leave the same direction. So they never encounter that commotion mm -hmm. out in the front. That makes sense. And so she's very specific about it, and I'm fully accommodating for that, and it works well for her dog. So uh, whatever we can do to make the visit easier for them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's something too, also with why we come to you is mm. how accommodating you are. And yeah. I think that's something when people go and look to start finding out what vet they're going to be using, finding right. somebody like yourself right. who's willing to accommodate those dogs yeah. in specific situations is yeah. really important. You get, you gotta um, do what you can to make the dogs visit the easiest because that makes my job easier. Right. If they're all worked up even before I enter the room, that makes my job 100% tougher because now i got to work with a worked up, agitated dog, which isn't fun. Mm -hmm. So I want them calm and relaxed and I want them to like me. Right. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> if they don't like me by the end of the visit, that, that's not a good visit. Right. Yeah. And it does make it a lot easier on your part if they yes. do like you. Yes, exactly. Well, what else kind of in general would you recommend people know or do if they're considering adopting yeah. a senior dog? Well, I think the biggest thing is, well, two big things probably. One, it's going to be a time commitment because mm -hmm. these dogs a lot of times have special needs. They have chronic diseases that are going to be, uh, they're going to need special attention for their long term. And so it's not going to be where, you know, you're going to have be able to just leave them alone for a long period of time. They have special needs, um, whether it be incontinence or orthopedic issues. Um, you're going to have, it's a time commitment. 
Um, and then the other thing is um, obviously economic issues um, because they, they, a lot of them have chronic diseases where they need medications um, to make so that they're not painful, um, special diets sometimes. Um, you're going to have to bring them in more frequently. Um, you're going to find that they're going to have organ failure or things that needed to be, needed to be addressed um, you know, every year. Uh, and they're gonna come, those diseases are going to come up where you're going to have to have the income to support that mm -hmm. if you're going to give them the best quality of life possible. So it's not like a puppy where uh, you, know, you just have the one-year routine stuff. You're going to have more than that. And I think, though, a puppy comes with their own set of problems it does. and difficulties. Yes, it does. So it does. I yes. feel like some people might be a bit hesitant at first when they're talking about adopting a dog and yes. adopting a senior yes. dog because yes. they're older. They're yes. not going to live as long. Right, right. But there's a there lot of people advantages. that are not going to be able to take a new puppy into their Correct. home and they should Correct. be adopting an older dog. And there's, yes. plus, there's pros and cons on both sides of yes. it. Yes, yes. And I think that we need to kind of... Uh, yes. Definitely there's some good things, wonderful things about senior dogs. First of all, <clears throat> most of them are house trained already. You mm -hmm. don't have to go through that. They usually are not big chewers unless they have some emotional issues, but most of them are just content um, like here to just sleep on the couch all day long and, and that's it. So they're not really rambunctious. They don't get into trouble as far as chewing and things like that a lot. So their activity level is a lot less. Right. Um, so that's a big advantage. Um, and you don't have to go through all those puppy things. Right. People that are going to go out yes. and go hiking and live a really active lifestyle, adopt Maybe. a younger dog. But right. if you exactly. have a more laid back lifestyle yes. or elderly couples that right. want to get a companion, exactly. an older dog is kind of the perfect right. fit for that right. scenario. Exactly. Um, it's been known for a long time that um, pets will <clears throat> do a lot for your stress level. Mm -hmm. So an older pet, when you come home after a really long day, and just like this one, just come up and lay on your lap, and you're just petting them, that does a lot for your blood pressure, and it does a lot for uh, you know, your stress level. And so these are the types of dogs that can help decompress you after a long day, uh, and they love it. Mm -hmm. So, and they're not all of a sudden wound up and like, oh, they're home now, let's go out and run, when that's the last thing you wanna do. And yeah. there's a lot of them out there that yes. need homes. So. Exactly, they do, yes. <laughs> Hopefully this little video here will help kind yes. of explain to some people what they should be doing when mm -hmm. they're getting a senior dog and dispel some of the myths about why they wouldn't want a senior dog. Right. And they give uh, a lot of love. Right. They a lot of love. Yeah, they and, are cool. Uh, Every, everybody that um, adopts a, a dog here from Bob's house, um, I see a lot of them. And uh, when it comes time to say goodbye, um, they always tell me they would do it again. Mm -hmm. You know, they may only have them for two, three years, but uh, they'll do it again because they know how much um, that dog gave to them. Um, and it was worthwhile. Yeah, and even for that goes short period of time. both ways, how much yeah. the dog gives to them and how much they can give to the dog. Exactly. So. Yep. All right. Well, Dr. Bull, thank you You're for welcome. sitting down with me. You bet. My it pleasure. It was fun.